Makes Me Want to Holler by Nathan McCall. Chapter 12. Superfly. I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. I'm that nigga in the alley. I'm your doctor when you need. Want some coke? Have some weed. You know me. I'm your friend. Your main boy, thick and thin. I'm your pusher man. Curtis Mayfield from the soundtrack of Superfly. It seemed those lyrics from Curtis Mayfield's album Superfly were blasting from every radio and sound system in black America in 1972. In the movie, actor Ron O'Neill played Priest, a high-rolling, slick-dressing drug dealer who was on a mission to earn a million dollars, enough money so he wouldn't have to work for the white man for the rest of his life. He built up a sizable family of low-level partners, negotiated all the rip-off landmines in the hood, and stayed one step ahead of the rollers. In the end, he did what he set out to do. He made his money selling cocaine, kicked Whitey's ass, and rode off into the sunset in his shiny El Dorado. Almost instantly, Priest became a cult figure for brothers everywhere. Here was a film that gave us something rare in movies, a black hero, and expressed the frustrations of a lot of young brothers who were so fed up with the white man that they were willing to risk prison and even death to get away from him. Perhaps for the first time in this country's history, young blacks were searching on a large scale for alternatives to the white mainstream. One option, glamorized by Superfly, was the drug trade, the black urban answer to capitalism. Superfly influenced the style, thinking, and choices that a lot of young black men began making around that time. I know it deeply affected me. I came out of that movie more convinced than ever that the white man and I were like oil and water. We didn't mix. My partner Shell Shock was on the same wavelength. We started thinking that maybe there was a future in dealing drugs. A few weeks after we saw the movie, we were sitting around at his place getting wasted when Shell Shock outlined his game plan, which was essentially a scaled down version of the plan Priest had devised in the movie. I know I can do it, man. Most of the white folks that got money did something illegal to get it. Look at how the Kennedys got started. They bootlegged liquor during the Depression, then went legit. Now they millionaires. All I gotta do is make enough money to start my own business, then I can quit the drug game. It was short-sighted, far-fetched fantasy for sure. But to our way of thinking, it was no more far-fetched than a civil rights notion that white people would welcome us into their system with open arms if we begged and prayed and marched enough. As for the risk, dealing drugs seemed no more risky than working a thankless job at the shipyard for 30 years, always under the fear of being laid off. It was six of one and half a dozen of the other. Shell shock had no problem getting started. Back then, a four-finger OZ, an ounce of reefer that equaled the height of four fingers, sold for $20. Shell Shock bought a $20 bag and broke it down into five $5 bags, which he then sold for a $5 profit and reinvested. He continued recycling his profits until he eventually was able to buy a quarter, half, and full pounds of reefer and sell $5, $10, and $20 bags. He hired a few guys in school, increased his profit margin, and maintained a hefty stash for his personal use. In no time, Shell Shock was on his way. I had no interest in selling drugs. It was too time consuming, and I had money and clothes coming in for the stick up Shell Shock and I did. I've been smoking reefer since I was 16 when my brother Dwight turned me on during one of his visits home from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he was stationed in the Army. Dwight and I got busted once with some reefer outside a nightclub on a military base. We were sitting inside his car, talking to joint, when some MPs with narc dogs walked up and ordered us out. They shook us down and found the reefer. Instead of arresting us, 
They took our names and addresses and barred us from the compound, threatening to press charges if we ever showed up there again. So I smoked a lot, but didn't deal. I left that to Shell Shock, who eventually became a big man around school and in the neighborhood. Guys looking to cop reefer sought him out when they got paid, and girls who loved to smoke herb flocked to him for a free high. He'd get them high, screw them, then put them out of his mother's house. For a lot of guys, Superfly brought home the economic potential in selling cocaine. We never even knew much about Snow until we saw that movie. Until then, most of the local dealers in Cavalier Manor sold only reefer. The problem with reefer was that it was bulky and cumbersome to carry around and conceal, and you had to sell large quantities to turn a decent profit. But the tiny aluminum foil wrapped packets of cocaine were easier to handle and small quantities brought higher profits. With cocaine, a dude can make more money with less hassle. Superfly also inspired a major fashion revolution. Almost overnight, brothers shifted from black power chic to gangster buffoon. Suddenly, cats who had been sporting dashikis and monster afros broke out in platform shoes and crushed velvet outfits that made them look like clownish imitations of the flamboyant priest. Shellshock and I fell right into line. We went out and brought wide brim hats and long midi and maxi coats. We wore turtlenecks and hung gold coke spoons around our necks, just like the one worn by priests. I thought I was a cat's meow when I got my first pair of platforms. They made me a full foot taller and the heels were so high I had to adjust my pimp to keep from breaking my ankle, but I knew I was cool. Dudes coming home from the Vietnam War in the 1970s were worse than that. They tried to be right on black and super fly at the same time. Cats like Horace Perry, the older dude who used to stuff dirt into my mouth, came home with a new consciousness, a sense of history and pride that changed the way they viewed this country and their place in it. Horace Perry and other dudes who gone into the war vowed to have nothing to do with the white man system. They came home calling each other brother man and blood and treated each other with more respect than they had before they left. When they ran into each other on the street, they performed dap, a handshake greeting which they went through a long series of syncopated movements, slapping each other's palms, wrists, and elbows in a colorful show of black solidarity. One guy who used to school the fellas and me about sex now talked instead about how there was going to be a revolution and that at some as yet undisclosed time, the word would be given and the race war would begin. Pretty soon it's going to be all over for Mr. Charlie, he said. Some heads are going to roll. At the same time, the military dudes outdid everybody else with outlandish superfly fashions. Some had traveled to Korea, Germany, and other countries and discovered they could get tailor-made clothes dirt cheap. They came back to the world with some of the craziest looking polyester knit outfits imaginable. There were so few movies featuring blacks that we rushed to theaters every time one was released. The Mac, a movie about a black pimp, picked up where Superfly left off. Lyrics from the soundtrack became the rallying cry for cats who wanted to be players, cool and confident dudes who lived life on their terms, not the white man's. After seeing the Mac, some of the fellas and I even talked dreamily sometimes about the prospect of putting holes on the block or becoming gigolos. I was sitting around talking about it one day when the old head sobered me up. He looked me up and down and said, Nigga, you'll start trying to sell dick. I knew he was right, but I thought at the very least it seemed worth trying to find a woman to take care of you. That was a sure way to get over. The irony of the soundtracks to Superfly and the Mac is they both contain songs with strong anti-drug, pro-black messages. I was so caught up in the glitz and glamour of the street smart stars that those messages went right over my head. Also lost on me was the contradiction in the whole notion of getting over. Drug dealers and pimps operate on familiar turf, preying on their own people, 
But like so many other guys, I reasoned that the end justified the means. Any hustle that kept you out of the system was justifiable. I'm sure Superfly and the Mac helped boost luxury car sales in America. After seeing those films, dudes everywhere went deep into debt to buy big cars to profile in. They added imitation gangster white wall tires and long gaudy TV antennas that hung like octopus tentacles from the rear windows. There wasn't a television set to be found in most of those cars. One older, mid-level drug dealer in Cavalier Manor bought a Mac-like car and became the envy of the neighborhood. He cruised around, profiling in a candy apple red convertible Cadillac with a silver statuette of a winged goddess perched regally on the tip of the hood. It was tacky plush inside, with white fur around the steering wheel, white fur covered seats, and a pair of oversized foam rubber dice, the symbol for players, dangling from the rear view mirror. When token the joint and soaking up the mobile plushness of a gigantic hog, it was easy to fantasize about being the Mac. Strains from a song that described the pimp's car and the way he rode in it could be heard floating out the pretender's windows. Diamond in the back, sunroof top, digging in the scene with a gangster lean. It became hip to cruise slowly, coolly down the street with your wrist resting limply on the steering wheel while you lean to the side. Imitating Goldie, the pimp in the movie, guys cruised down the street, gangster leaning so hard to the right of the steering wheel that it looked like they were actually sitting in the middle of the car rather than in the driver's seat. All pedestrians could make out from the sidewalk was the driver's beady eyes, peering from beneath the wide brim hat that shone just above the dashboard. Most of those cats didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, but they had their cars, and that was a start. In our crowd, few dudes had their own rides. We profiled in our parents' cars. Every now and then, my stepfather let me drive his Cadillac to the store. I'd take the long way home, riding through Cavalier Manor, fantasizing and gangsterling like the world was my playground. With the invention of 8-track tape players and side cars, we used rides as much to entertain and socialize as to transport. Gas prices then were so low that $5 could fill your tank and you could ride around all day. Whenever one of us got our parents' car, we go around and pick up the rest of the fellas. We pitch in and buy a full tank of gas and ride around the city for hours at a time, profiling and collecting girls' phone numbers. While cruising, we got high, listening to tapes by War, Stevie Wonder, the OJs, and Earth, Wind & Fire. And we talked about such things as the Watergate hearings and rumors that platform shoes we wore were part of the conspiracy to ruin black men's spines. The luxury car has always been a big status symbol for black men. It's a mobile status symbol. A dude can ride it around town and show the world that he owns a thing of style, comfort, and beauty. While cruising in an elegant car, he can pretend he's doing well, even if he isn't and fantasize about making his entire world as plush as his ride. Even old heads like my stepfather got into that fantasy. Although he struggled financially, he always made sure he had an old car to beat around in and a nice hog, a Cadillac, to show off. He didn't give a damn about clothes, but a hog was the one extravagance my stepfather allowed himself. He brought his first one in 1971, and hasn't been without one since. My mother used to get nervous as hell every time we rode by a Cadillac dealership. She used to be scared that he'd see something he liked and find a way to buy it. The white men who sold the cars knew they had a potentially good catch whenever my stepfather came on the lot. They'd even let him take a hog home and test drive it for a few days, knowing that if he was a true Cadillac lover, he'd break down and get one. The only time I saw my old man really happy was when he brought a new hog. It was his plaything, his reward to himself for all that hard work he did and all the shit he took off of white folks. 
and nobody, not even mama, got in his way of him enjoying it. Sometimes on weekends, he'd wash and wax his Cadillac, shower, get dressed, and ride slowly around town, even if he had nowhere special to go. He might have been feeling a little low when he left, but I could always tell he felt better when he got back home. 